Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to uh, our event on fixing FOIA, co-presented by uh, the Wikimedia Yale Law School Initiative on Intermediaries and Information and the Abrams Institute for Freedom of Expression. My name is Michael Karanikolas. I'm the Wikimedia Fellow at Yale ISP. I will remind everyone at the outset that this event is being recorded, um, and we also have uh, translation enabled. Um, so you should see a box at the bottom of your screen where you can select uh, English or Spanish. We are um, planning to reserve the last 30 minutes or so for audience Q&A. Um, so uh, we would invite you folks to uh, put uh, questions directly into the chat um, if they're interested at any point, uh, or we would also very much welcome folks to, to raise their hands and ask them directly at that point. Um, we titled this event, Fixing FOIA. Um, there is uh, an, an implicit assumption there, uh, assumption there that the system is uh, in need of, of some repair. Probably that's, that's not a controversial statement to, to folks who use it regularly. Uh, but the purpose of today's conversation is to discuss whether there are potentially better ways to manage things, particularly in terms of how appeals and oversight are structured. These are enormously important elements to a strong freedom of information system in terms of providing effective redress to instances where public bodies are failing to comply with the spirit of the law or the letter of the law. And without an effective system of redress, the system uh, can be enormously frustrating to requesters, but it also makes it more difficult to push for improvements in implementation or even to monitor uh, where the system is succeeding and where the system is failing. I imagine most folks with us today are at least somewhat familiar with how oversight and appeals are managed in the US system. But around the world, around about two thirds of countries that have right to information or access to information or freedom of information laws delegate appeals and oversight to an independent administrative body. These systems are not uniform in terms of their, their quality and the resources that they're able to dedicate to uh, playing this role. However, we are very fortunate today to have uh, two panelists with us who are representing two excellent and very highly regarded oversight structures uh, who can share a bit about their role. Carolyn Maynard is the Information Commissioner of Canada. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Maynard was the Interim Chairperson and Chief Executive Officer of the Military Grievance External Review Committee from January 2017 to March 2018, after serving as Director uh, General Operations and General Counsel in the organization for a number of years. Earlier in her career, she was legal counsel in the Office of the Judge Advocate General and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, External Review Committee. Ms. Maynard also worked with the Canada Revenue Agency and briefly in private practice. Oscar Mauricio Guerra Ford has served as a commissioner of the National Institute for Transparency, Access to Information and Personal Data Protection or INAI, INAI since 2014. Prior to that, he was a president commissioner of the Institute for Access to Public Information and Data Protection of the Federal District, Mexico City, from March 2006 to May 2014. He has also served as the president of the Mexican Conference for Access to Public Information, which brought together all of Mexico's authorities responsible for guaranteeing transparency and access to public information in the country. Mr. Guerra has over 38 years of experience as an associate professor at uh, UNAM's Faculty of Economics and has written 35 articles discussing transparency, access to information and accountability systems and personal data protection. Our third panelist uh, who can uh, uh, represent uh, the, the American perspective and, and, and discuss uh, the current state of play uh, here uh, is uh, Matthew Lee Weiner. Uh, he is the acting chairman, uh, vice chairman and executive director of the Administrative Conference of the United States. In 2016, President Obama nominated him to be the conference's chairman. Before affiliated with the, affiliating with the conference, Mr. Weiner was general counsel to U.S. Senator Arlen Specter, counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary, a partner at Deckert LLP, and special counsel to Cuneo, Gilbert, and Leduca. Mr. Weiner is an elected member of the American Law Institute and a fellow of the American Bar Association, a lecturer in law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and the co-chair of the Adjudication Committee of the American Bar Association Section on Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice. Uh, he holds a JD from Stanford Law School, where he was articles editor of the Stanford Law Review and an AB from William and Mary. Um, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation and the opportunity to discuss these comparative models to try and consider their potential applicability to the American context uh, and what potential considerations might be important 
in setting up such an agency in the federal system. Uh, however, our, our starting point for that discussion has to be to introduce where the US system currently stands. Uh, so we will go to Mr. Wiener first for a brief presentation on the FOIA system. Thank you very much, Michael, and, uh, and to you and David, our host, for having me today. I'm very, very happy to be here to contribute my uh, knowledge and learning, however limited it may be, um, but also to um, learn from our other panelists and discussants during the next uh, program, um, because the Administrative Conference is uh, um, is, is interested in uh, uh, undertaking, as it always is, um, um, a project or research to improve the um, FOIA system in our country, especially the FOIA enforcement system. And I would, will say this is that I very much after today's event, I definitely welcome outreach um, with suggestions, ideas, comments, and so forth, uh, either directed to me or um, my colleague, uh, Danny Shulkin, who's on the phone uh, who's on the, who's a participant today or in the audience today, and she is our FOIA point person. Let me just say something at the outset about ACUS. I don't know if, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with ACUS. It's the Administrative Conference of the United States, um, a very, not a very well-known agency in the United States. Uh, perhaps it's best known, uh, uh, perhaps it's best known in some ways as being um, the place where uh, Antonin Scalia, the later Justice Scalia, started his career, and he, 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 of course, wrote a famous or infamous article on FOIA, The Emperor Has No Clothes, which I'm sure many of you, some of you at least, have read. Um, ACUS is a, a, a small federal agency. We make recommendations to other agencies about administrative procedure. We have no power to enforce our recommendations. Uh, they're hortatory, uh, I suppose, would be the best way to put it. Um, we have issued um, numerous recommendations to uh, other agencies on um, proactive disclosure, of late in particular, proactive disclosure of uh, various types of materials, adjudication materials, guidance documents, uh, information about the identity of government officials, and so forth and so on. And on our website, you will find a, uh, a tab uh, entitled Public Availability of Information, which I encourage you to visit. One of the areas in which ACUS works, and I think that's particularly relevant to today's conversation, is uh, we, if we have expertise in anything uh, that other agencies don't have, it's adjudication procedures government-wide uh, at administrative agencies. And I hope to bring some of our learning on that subject to bear on the conversation. Before I, before I proceed further, um, I would like to, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are two agencies within the federal government uh, that are devoted exclusively towards enforcing, uh, enforcing or promoting the enforcement of FOIA. One is the Office of Information Policy within the Department of Justice. The other is the uh, Office of um, uh, Office of Government Information Services, sometimes known as OGIS, within the National Records and Archive Administration. And I'll say a few things more about both of those agencies uh, in a minute. They are our, they are our two. FOIA specific agencies within uh, the federal government. Uh, we do not have though uh, an equivalent to what Mexico has or what Canada has as I understand their administrative schemes. Uh, and and that's, that's, that I suppose is why uh, I'm here in part. There are, two, there are two key points that I would like to make just by way of introduction to help frame our discussion. Um, and they're certainly not unique to me, but they are important points nonetheless. Um, and, and that is that the FO our FOIA system, like uh, many US public law systems, is, is in many ways highly decentralized. It's decentralized in, in two respects. The first, our disclosure re regime relies largely, but not exclusively, on individual requests, requests from private sector actors, uh, individuals, corporations, nonprofits its educational institutions, so forth and so on. They say not exclusively relies uh, on individual requests because um, as we might talk about some more today, FOIA does impose some affirmative or disclosure, uh, excuse me, affirmative or proactive disclosure requirements um, that are uh, especially important and, and could well take on greater importance uh, as a solution to 
uh, fix some of the problems associated with FOIA. Our system is uh, decentralized in a second respect, um, and that is that its enforcement mechanism, our, I think our main subject today is decentralized. A dissatisfied requesters only recourse, um, subject to um, one qualification I'll offer in a second, is to file a lawsuit in uh, a federal district court. Uh, our federal judiciary in turn is decentralized as, uh, um, as a result of its uh, multi-district structure, which defeats uniformity and interpretation of law and application of the law to particular categories of documents. Um, admittedly, a large percentage of the cases um, do get filed in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia as a result of special venue provisions. Um, but nonetheless, our FOIA adjudication, I think it's fair to say our FOIA, uh, federal court FOIA adjudication is scattered throughout the country and vested in multiple district courts who may have different, that may have different perspectives. Uh, this, of course, is the result of a deliberate congressional design. Uh, the Congress did not entirely trust agencies to adjudicate FOIA disputes, as uh, Congress has entrusted agencies to do with other sites of, types of claims. And it um, gave uh, dissatisfied requesters recourse directly to the federal courts, um, where the cases would, at least under the statutory language, um, be uh, litigated on a de novo basis, as we call it, uh, which is to say without, without deference to uh, the agency's interpretation. Um, in fact, um, and in practice, uh, the system doesn't quite work like that. There is a lot of deference built into judicial doctrines when courts go to um, evaluate uh, agency denials of requests. I do want to issue, I do want to offer an, an important qualification to the suggestion to my statement that FOIA requesters re only real recourse is judicial and non-administrative. Um, we do have, um, uh, as I mentioned, an agency called the Office of Government and Information Services, OGIS, um, which does among, among its other admirable activities, um, does provide dispute resolution services, non-binding dispute resolution services to resolve disputes between uh, agencies and requesters. Um, probably, best, probably best to characterize it as being akin to uh, mediation. Um, OGIS is, uh, it's important to add what might be sometimes called a, a micro agency as, as is my agency. Uh, the staff there is very small. At my last count, it was under 10. Uh, and that, would, that should probably give you a pretty good I, I, uh, sense as to um, what its limited capabilities are to resolve disputes. And I mean that in no way as a criticism, uh, that office does excellent work. Uh, the, other office, um, the other office is the office that should be mentioned is the Office of Information Policy, OIP, within the Department of uh, Justice. Uh, that office does a number of important things, um, including um, uh, overseeing FOIA compliance through a, a reporting regime, regime but it is not an adjudication. It's not an adjudicative agency, uh, just as OGIS is not an adjudicative agency. Um, neither, neither of those agencies has rulemaking authority or adjudicative authority or what you might call more gent broadly enforcement authority. Um, before turning it over to the other panelists, um, I th it, it is uh, one we could imagine um, there are imaginable and within the U.S. system, I think realistically aspirational administrative alternatives to the current uh, agency-specific adjudication system. Um, you could um, you could certainly well imagine um, a, um, a a system in which uh, we have special um, FOIA adjudicators within agencies who have perhaps a greater degree of independence from the agencies than FOIA adjudicators currently do within agencies. Um, you could also man manage uh, a regime in a system in which um, um, authority to adjudicate FOIA disputes uh, is vested in 
a independent agency of some sort or another. And it is not on, there are numerous examples in the federal government, of course, of uh, one agency uh, adjudicating claims involving another agency. We have the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which adjudicates claims between federal employees um, and uh, agencies relating to personnel matters. Um, the Merit Systems Protection Board and the Office of Special Counsel um, engage in similar adjudicative activities. Um, there, another possibility, of course, would be to have some kind of um, what, what we sometimes call in this country an administrative court, uh, an Article I court referring to a court uh, that's not constituted under Article III of the Constitution under which the judges have life tenure and so forth. Uh, but we do have numerous administrative courts um, that really do function as, as courts. And you could imagine a system in which FOIA disputes go to such a, go to, go to such a court. Um, I'm not suggesting that, that 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 type of system would um, there would be costs and benefits associated with that kit system that would ha be have to be carefully evaluated. Um, but it is something that ought to be considered uh, when we start talking about a more centralized adjudication enforcement scheme within the within the federal government. Now, of course, if you were to, uh, of course, if if the U.S. were to go to a system where um, um, we placed more um, uh, where we placed more emphasis on administrative adjudication um, and independent administrative adjudication with agencies. We'd have to decide what to provide on the judicial review end. Uh, would we pro would we provide a more deferential standard of review as exists with most judicial review of administrative action? Or would we retain the current de novo system? There are many, many possibilities here. Um, and I look forward to um, discussing them with our panelists and also uh, hearing suggestions from the audience um, in which I know a lot, I've seen some of the names here, a lot of, lot of learning definitely resides. So um, with that, um, uh, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Michael, and we can hear about uh, international models. Of course, I guess I should say that there are state models too on which we might draw. And I'd be very interested to react to the, some of them and answer such questions as whether these would be viable in the United States politically or legally, and whether they would be advisable in our system. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Michael, with my thanks. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Excellent framing of the issue. Um, we can go now to uh, Carolyn Maynard uh, for uh, an introduction uh, to the Canadian system. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So we do have a little PowerPoint uh, presentation so that everybody can follow me. A very different system here in Canada, as you're going to be hearing. Um, so. The access to information, we don't call it freedom of, uh, of information here, it's access to information, uh, was first uh, implemented in Canada through a federal act, uh, which is, uh, was, it, was uh, uh, it came into effect in 1983. Um, so you can go to the next uh, slide, Alex. So in 1983, uh, the Federal Access to Information Act was um, put in effect and the act created my office. It's an office of the Information Commissioner of Canada and that's at the federal level. We also have uh, provincial acts of access to information and there's 14 different uh, jurisdiction in Canada that uh, deals with access to information. Most of provinces also have the mandate to, re to uh, investigate privacy breaches. At the federal level, uh, luckily for me, they separated the two offices. So we have a commissioner of privacy and we have the access to information commissioner. The access to information act, uh, the, the right of access in Canada has been um, uh, found to be a quasi constitutional uh, right uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, here you can see as, um, a quote from a very famous cases in 1997, where uh, the Supreme Court acknowledged that freedom of access uh, and freedom of expression included having access to information so that citizen could participate and, uh, and meaningfully in a democracy and that our political uh, and bureaucrats are accountable to our citizens. 
The, uh, my mandate as an information commissioner is to investigate complaints that are relating to requests that are made by our Canadians under the Access to Information. Uh, I am an independent agent of Parliament, which means that uh, the Prime Minister of Canada has recommended my appointment, but it had to be approved by the um, uh, Chamber of uh, the um, all the, the MPs and all of the Senates. Uh, so I had to to appear before those two uh, committees and the uh, the parliament itself had to approve my appointments. Uh, I am appointed for seven years, so I cannot be uh, removed from my uh, my position for a, a, a good uh, seven years. So I have about four more years to go. Um, the mandate of the commissioner is to protect information rights. Uh, so I do have uh, a very specific mandate to investigate complaints. Uh, with respect to either the fact that the, uh, somebody did not receive the information they requested uh, on time. So institutions have 30 days to respond to an access request at the federal level. And or uh, they requested an extension that the person finds is unreasonable. I also have the, the mandate to investigate uh, refusal complaints, which are uh, when an institution, a, a public body has added um, or has used exemptions and exclusions, uh, and that the person feels that they should receive more information that they received. I am the first level in independent review, meaning that once my complaint, uh, the investigation is over, uh, a complainant or an institution can go to federal court and ask for a review of the decision. Um, I'll get into more details a little bit later um, about that. So like I said earlier, Information, the uh, Canadians have the right to ask all federal institutions uh, for in information that is under their control. Um, if they're not satisfied with the response or if they're not satisfied with the time that it took to respond to their uh, requests, they have a right to complain to my office. They have 60 days to, to make that complaint. And we have, like I said, two types of, of, of complaints, the delay complaints, and or refusal, which are with the application of exemptions and exclusions. Uh, the powers of the commissioners are uh, very broad. Uh, it includes the fact that I, I can myself initiate a complaint. So if I see that something is um, uh, seems to be going uh, wrong with an institutions, I can initiate my own complaint and investigate. I have the uh, order making powers. So for 36 years and since 1983, the act had not been uh, reviewed. And uh, the commissioner only had the ability to make recommendation to an institution, which uh, was very uh, limiting because as you can, you can imagine, an institution refused to give you information. The, the information commissioner believes that you are entitled to that information. And all I could do was making a recommendation to the institution to actually disclose the information. Sorry. Um, in, 19, in 2019, in June 2019, the act was reviewed and I was finally given the um, authority to make orders. So now I can order an institution to actually disclose information that I believe uh, the Canadian uh, requester is entitled to. Uh, I'm also able to review all the information uh, that is protected by the institution. So for example, if you ask for information and they uh, say that it's a solicitor client privilege document and refuse to give it to you, I can see the document in, in its full authority and confirm that it is a legal opinion or that it's, it's uh, protected by the solicitor client privilege. Um, the only documents that I'm not allowed to see are cabinet confidence. Uh, those are um, in respect to government decisions, which uh, it, they are excluded from the act. Uh, this is something that I've been asking the government to change. Uh, I can tell you that uh, requesters are very uh, troubled by the fact that uh, those type of documents are not being seen by my office. Uh, so we have to rely on the, what the institution is telling us. If they say it's a cabinet confidence, uh, we have to um, take it for granted. 
Uh, I believe that we do need uh, an independent review for those type of documents too. Uh, as a, a, an anecdote, I, uh, I've seen it in one document where they made by mistake, they gave it to us and we realized it was not a cabinet confidence. So those kind of things, uh, sometimes we, we realize that if I had the ability to actually see the documents, uh, I think our Canadians would trust our government uh, more and more. In with, with respect to their ability to identify the uh, the documents that they should be releasing or not. Um, the new act also, the, the, the changes to the act also allow me, allow institutions now to refuse to respond to an access request. Um, if it's, if they think it's vexatious, if the request is made in bad faith, or if it's otherwise an abuse of the right of access. The only caveat is that they cannot do it without my approval, which is a protection that the uh, government has added to our act. So for example, I've recently had six requests from institution to um, uh, not act on a request. And most of them it's because the, the amount of documents that are requested are felt to be unreasonable. We have one case where the person's request was so broad that it would have meant that the institution would have had to go through 22 million pages of documents. Um, so in those type of uh, files, the institution has to prove to us that they tried as their best to talk with the, the, uh, the requester and to scope down the, uh, the request and um, in that the, it would be completely unreasonable for them to, uh, uh, to respond to uh, those type of requests. Um, so it doesn't happen very often. We only approved it once since I've got this, uh, this new authority, uh, but I'm sure like um, we'll see more and more. Uh, one thing that you should know, it's only $5 in Canada to ask for uh, information. There is no fees uh, for photocopy. There's no fees for time that it takes to search for the documents. Uh, that's something that uh, our public institutions are complaining about because it is um, uh, a huge uh, undertaking sometimes to, to find the documents and to respond to access requests. Uh, what I tell them is that it's part of our public service uh, duty. Uh, again, like I said, it's a quasi-constitutional uh, right. And I think uh, Canadian, hopefully, as much as they, we can have uh, re, uh, reasonable requests, uh, are entitled to that information so that they can question decisions that are made by our government, how money is being spent and why policies are being taken. Um, so this is um, important. And uh, I'm trying to get them to like encourage the, the, you know, the, the, the institutions to provide more and more information also on a on a voluntary basis instead of having to wait for an access request, but it's not something that's easy. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit of how, when I make, uh, when I conclude uh, uh, you know, investigations, uh, I can report the, uh, the findings of my investigation uh, through uh, initial and final reports to the institution and to the complainant. So I have to tell them what the findings are and what the recommendations or uh, order that I intend to make are through these reports. I also have the authority to make, um, I have an obligation actually to make an annual report every year to explain what happened during the year. But I also have the authority to uh, table special reports to parliament. And uh, the special reports are usually when an issue has been found uh, through an investigation that is so important that parliament should be aware right away uh, that I cannot wait until the annual report uh, to, uh, to issue that special report. Uh, for example, I'm about to table a special report with respect to uh, our immigration and refugee um, uh, agency here in Canada uh, on the fact that on the basis that they received 120,000 requests last year and it was um it led to about four thousand complaints to my agency uh because mainly because they were late there were so many access requests uh they were not able to meet their 30-day time uh limit um so we did a uh, an investigation that i self-initiated and luckily the institution was very collaborative because they're looking for ways to help themselves too. They don't have the resources to respond to 120,000 access requests per year. 
Uh, they need to know what they can do better. And so our special report will be tabled in May with um, hoping uh, to, to give them some good solutions for the future. Um, some of the challenges that we're going through in Canada, uh, definitely there is a culture within government institutions uh, that we call a, a culture of secrecy. And there's also a culture of um, allowing delays to, to add up. Uh, while they have a, a statutory timeline of 30 days to respond to access requests, we've seen over the years that that 30 days is not being met in about 50% of the cases. Uh, they're asking extensions more and more. Um, and because my office only had the authority to make recommendations, I don't think that institutions were very afraid of us before, but now that I have the authority to order uh, um, some specific actions, uh, we see that they are moving a little bit faster and they are uh, respecting our uh, investigations or at least our recommendations or, or, or they're trying to resolve cases more and more. We also have uh, um, issues, like I said, with delays. We have issues with resources. Uh, I have to say access to information is not an easy job. Uh, dealing with requesters that are need their information yesterday, you know, they don't want to wait another couple of weeks. And we are also dealing with internal people who have other things to do. They, they don't see that access to information is important because they are uh, dealing with their own uh, program. Uh, so these poor folks that are working in units of access to information units in within the institutions are having to deal with both sides. And I feel for them. So we also we have a really hard time um, recruiting people to work in that field. Uh, we have problem uh, retaining them because everybody's stealing from each other. Uh, out of the 250, 250 institutions who are subjected to my act, uh, every institution has its own unit. So we have units like um, in Immigration Canada where they have 200 workers responding only to access to information requests. That's all they do, that's their job. Uh, CRA, the uh, Canadian Revenue Agency, same thing. They have a big, big unit of 250 people working only on access. Uh, but we also have smaller institutions that we may have eight or six you know, people working in that area. So uh, the demand is high. Um, so I always uh, encourage people if they want to have a job. Uh, I have three kids now in university. I'm like, you can get into access, you'll get a job for sure. Um, we also have uh, some issues with uh, the fact that in Canada, we do not have uh, a legislative uh, requirement to document decisions or document uh, meetings or document. And uh, so I'm trying to convince the government to do that. Uh, we have a directive that encourage the duty to document, but uh, I think that we need to move forward and have a legislative uh, obligation, uh, especially with COVID. Now we've seen that everybody's working from home. There is a lot of uh, meetings like this uh, being uh, probably not recorded. So uh, when people are asking information and we are told there's no minutes or there's no uh, briefing notes or there's no document that um, uh, leads to the decision that was made by the document, it's very troublesome. So I think a, a duty to document would be a welcoming uh, change. The other thing we don't have in Canada, we don't have a declassification regime uh, for national security documents. So this is an issue that comes especially with historical documents. Uh, we have uh, historians and professors and, and researchers that are asking for documents that exist uh, 50 years ago but their, uh, their classification is still secret or top secret. And uh, it is very difficult for my office to investigate those type of requests. Uh, so hopefully, again, we, we provided some recommendations to our government to try to have uh, a timeline by which a document that is top secret, is secret or secret could become uh, not, uh, could, could be declassified and accessible uh, after, I don't know, 20 years, 50 years, they can pick the time, but it, it would be nice to have some kind of, uh, of declassification program. 
Uh, I saw a couple of questions going through, but I couldn't I couldn't respond. And maybe we can answer after I'm I'm done. Uh, I wanted to say um, the one thing that is very interesting too, with respect to my office, is that uh, when I make a decision to order uh, an institution to release an, uh, documents, uh, if the institution refused to follow my order, uh, they have to go to court. And when they go to court, I am allowed to represent the requester uh, because as you can imagine, the requester is in a very um, uh, disadvantage in those type of cases because they don't know what they're fighting for. They haven't seen the documents. So when I uh, when we do have a case like this, it is very, uh, I, I'm really happy. It's a de novo review by our courts. Uh, the decision that is being under review is the institution's re uh, decision to refuse to disclose, but I can bring up the argument on behalf of the requesters of why those documents should be disclosed. And I think that's a very good um, system, uh, a very fair system for our Canadians. So I'm gonna stop on that and uh, I'll be happy to respond to your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, if um, uh, if there is, uh, if the, the discussion in the chat is any indication has been an enormous amount of interest in that, uh, certainly. Um, we'll go now to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Guerra for a discussion of uh, the Mexican uh, I and AI. Well, I think I will begin. Well, good afternoon, good morning. First, I would like to say thank you to the rest of the panelists and for this invitation and the information of Mexico. I would like to begin by saying that our country is being more close to Canada than to United States because I would say some of the dates that are very important on the access to information in Mexico. One of them is 1977, when it was a request to the constitution that the state has the obligation to, and this was a reform that was very important that no mechanism was established. So it was left as dead letters, like we would say. In 2002, the change of alternative after 70 years of, of a government from one party in 2002, it was elaborated the, that it was re-elaborated the access to information where the state subnationals, they were generating their rules. So in the time of today is 33 laws, which is the federal law and then for each identity. In 2002, there was a reform and then another one in 2016 that tries to exercise in the whole country knowing that there are big differences how the access of information and the right to do that there is three constitutional reforms and a lot of reforms to laws and concludes in a general law for the whole country that can have some specific laws. So is where we are right now with the right to access this information and giving the INAI, the Coordination National, which is a national institute, which was a general before, and it gives the option to revise the decisions and the complaints when it comes to even if it's or a power of 
of a complaint of a inside of these 18 years, the law has continued to get better. I would say that here in Mexico, we have a very good law. It's either the first or second, but like you all know, a good law is a condition that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So it's, so it's established and I think in, in good terms, I would say Mexico has a even if he initiated as an organism that was decentralized, the federal one, some entities are starting to surge and now they are unique organisms. It is hard, not part of the executive or legislative or federal, it's an organ that is named by law and that is members, the commissioners is named by the Senate with two second part of the Senate. It, they, these organisms, they make their own decisions. They have a budget and with this budget, they can define the use. Of course, they have to show how they are using these funds. I think that the part that is very important of this uniqueness is on the name of their commissioners. They are all in and they have and pre-stated and named by themselves. But the attribution that is more important is that the resolution to the complaints of the citizens to not receiving this information from institutions and pub public institutions, they cannot hide behind the dependence in the case of Canada that can really appeal is the requested on a resolution or a uh, request that was not given. What removes is the right to be able to do that. We have to investigate that information. I would say that 90% of the requests are given. And if they are or if a person that affected or a public, then we give that information for acts of corruption. If this person from the Senate can be affected, they are reserved. In this case, we make an exception that the law marks, which is causes that are corruption, then we can order the to be publicized. And then they what they want to say is that if they give what the INAI ordered, which is a beginning to, which is the spread of this process. There is a confrontation in that sense. It's 3% that are denied, it's 120. We have resolved 12,000, 13,000 in that sense. One of the worries during this whole time is to expand the access to information so the most numbers of people can utilize it for their own good like a right that allows the exercise of other rights and they are able to exercise this through their request or requesting information on the websites or through the institutions in these times, we have expanded throughout different mechanisms and the request 
all the country nationally five, six years ago, no more than 300,000 now removing last year for, for being a year that wasn't too normal, which was about a million of the West, which is a third part and they are federal and other that gives information to, to the Mexican and other cities as well. And last year we made an exception because obviously it was reduced to like 800 requests in United States from the information system they, they have around 800,000, which is very similar, which is a diversity national. I'm not sure if this graphic is only showing the federal ones, but I know that the states don't really have, and they have access and institutions they can ask through the federal office. This is objective has been coming true, but there is always a complaint from a country that has 130 million people and they affect a, a different type of people. They have writers and et cetera. Cases like Casablanca that they have come at Objecting and requesting this type of information. Evidently, another worry is that even if there is not a request, which is the obligation by law, and this is in this is increasing the number, and evidently the amount of information that it has. One of the situations that we've seen in Mexico is this electric system to request, to make this request. We used to use Infomet, it was not integrated. And now we have the national platform that is interface and it allows to make request from one website and they can make to all institution over 8,000 institution and putting the complaint and look for the information for the whole country for all the obligation, which is really big. We have over 4,000 registers and they have multiple searches is very used by the citizen. It is very important, but evidently since we are analyzing what are the possible things to get better, a problem that we're having now is with the situation of the reservations. The last versions of the law catalog that is lower of information that is reserved. Sometimes in the interpretation in cases like national security or secure or public security, they want to put it in that box, things that we consider that are not, and we have to resolve in that situation. Another thing that is the documentation of process that are taken inside of the court and what process could be against the law or corruption cases because the law established the only documents that are being in the way are and another one that is very subjective that it speaks about the law of the oh, oh. um Um, we have no sound. Mr. Guerra is muted. I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. Guerra. Uh, uh, I think there was just a slight issue with your microphone. Uh, it, it, could you turn it back on? Perdón. Yes, sorry, we can hear you now. Sorry, it's just a slight well, technical issue. Yeah. Okay, ahora... Termino, tenemos un virus. Y, y, 
and I'm about to finish. We have a virus when it comes to the access of information that it has been going, increasing, is to declare that it doesn't exist information when we have shown that that is that document does exist. They may say it when there is another one is the incompetency that they say that they don't have the competency to detect that information. And it gives us as a resource that we have to say that in Mexico, out of 100 requests, six of these will become a complaint. And in the case of the organisms of transparency in a average of a 60%, we give the right or we say that the citizen is correct but there are people that after they receive the response they don't request the revision because having a we have to say that the 20 percent of the people the response it was not satisfactory so we have a gap in that and obviously Oh, it, the, the issue is with the governance and and they have to assume this right that is constitutional and i think that each person has to make the decision under being publicly and only to be able to the the law has to give a reason to why this information is being reserved and not being publicized. In these 18 years, it has been a great advance in how now people are voting in and we have to keep pushing. Another one that is a big issue is taking this right to sectors that are outside of the new technologies because 99 of the of the requests are being electronically and through the platform and the information is being publicized or public in the internet. We've seen some things like requests that are through the phone and we are working another alternative ways to be able to provide this information for groups that are indigenous and groups that are on the resource and another one that now the institution in the current government is being questioned because it's very it costs a lot and the budget should be enough and, and the budget that we have is 50 million dollars at, at, at the moment and the salary of the commissioners which has gone down lower than what the president and said. And now we are not being, and now the salary is about $5,000 a month. And that has been the argument, sobre la which it shouldn't be the argument about the existence of an institution like this. And the other one that hasn't given information in this case, like in the case of Odebrecht, the information hasn't been given because other government institutions, they have closed themselves or protected themselves under the courts. And right now we are in having a little bit of a dispute. We have to show that INAI and the access to information, it's very helpful. And the government says that the transparency should be the role to democracy or in a, lay, in a law like the one we have and the commitment that we have with the citizens to be able to be transparent. Another one, we can be more efficient. We don't have a problem if anything needs to be revised. We have come in the lower when it comes to the budget, but we continue to get more activities and more information. We have personal data to the citizens and 
other type of regulations that continue to, that we continue to receive is being an advance, but it is very important that I feel that in the last couple of months, it has been like stopping, even if we keep pushing and going forward. So this obstacle is outside of the way and we can continue to advance. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So um, we've now heard uh, an, an introduction to these two other systems. Um, we'll, we'll have a, a discussion. There's, there's been a lot of questions raised in the chat. Um, I, I'd like to go first uh, back to, to Mr. Wiener, who, who has now heard a bit about the Canadian and Mexican systems of oversight. I would love to get your initial thoughts and reflections on those last two presentations. You mentioned potential legal or challenge, uh, technical challenges to implementation. What, what are your thoughts uh, based on what you've just heard? Oh, uh, I, you are muted at the moment. Um, um, th these models, in effect, are not altogether unknown to the U.S. system. I mean, you could very well imagine um, uh, a, um, a vesting um, real adjudicative enforcement authority in an agency in a separate sort of quasi-independent agency of sorts um, within the executive branch of the U.S. government that would have um, uh, adjudicative authority uh, that would be um, um, binding on the agencies. Um, um, I, uh, I, I, I mean, one thing you would have to ask yourself is uh, what are the, uh, you know, what are the costs associated with doing that, and and obviously the benefits of doing so. But you could imagine a system. We could we could have a system like that. Uh, in the United States, I don't know if it's politically viable. Um, we could have a system like that that um, allows a one agency to uh, evaluate um, uh, another agency's um, withholding of information. The requester would go to that independent agency or the, the enforcement agency, I'll just call it that. And um, um, that agency, uh, I mean, if you were to set up a system like that, one, one thing you would have to ensure is that it works faster than the federal court system probably want to make some fairly robust provision for uh, some provision for sort of robust what we sometimes call in the U.S. in-camera review of documents to uh, facilitate um, um, uh, review and adjudication. Uh, I suppose an institution like that could also have uh, a mediation component uh, of the sort that uh, OGIS now uh, performs. Then we would have to, if we had a system like that, of course, we'd have to figure out what we're going to do with the federal courts. And um, um, uh, if a claimant were dissatisfied with a requester were dissatisfied with the decision of an administrative tri pr tribunal of the sort we're talking about here, um, the and the requester, what, what judicial review rights would would the requester have, and uh, what would the standard of review would be? Would we ratchet down the standard of, re of review to make it more deferential, as we do? Uh, in the case of judicial review of many agencies' decisions, or would we uh, retain uh, de novo review? You could also, I suppose, have, and there's a lot of possibilities here, and I'm not going to endorse one or the other because uh, I'm doing it with completely imperfect information, uh, but you could also have, uh, you could have a dual system, I suppose, where um, uh, there would be a choice of remedies of sort. Uh, requesters could go to uh, an independent agency, um, to adjudicate a FOIA dispute against a, uh, an agency that withheld documents, or it could go to federal court, or you could have some combination thereof. Um, there are a number of models uh, we, uh, that we have where um, uh, claimants against the federal government can kind of go to an agency or, or go to federal court. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission offers uh, one roughly analogous of exam example of the sort uh, that I'm talking about. Yeah, you, yeah, there, there is, and, and that's 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 really interesting. I, I would add um, potentially one other uh, uh, area of differentiation that is that is used in some systems, um, which is around the type of uh, review that you're looking for. So, so there are systems also that differentiate between allowing a certain type of review for procedural violations, like around timelines or or, or, or such like that, and and a substantive review is put through a different process. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 trying to um, push back against uh, uh, withholding uh, of information. Um, you, I, I do want to go back to the, the first thing that you raised, though, which is about the, the cost of, the, or sorry, the, the timeline for the process and its speed. 
I think it would be really interesting to go back to um, each of our other two panelists and maybe ask them about um, a few questions about how the system works from the requester's perspective. Um, the timeline for uh, appeals uh, as, 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 as they run, um, as well as potentially talking about um, the cost of appeals, um, whether requesters need to, need to pay a fee to access the system and how simple they are uh, for requesters to use. Do they need lawyers? Do they frequently use lawyers? And how easy is it to navigate? Maybe we could go back to uh, uh, Ms. Maynard first and then to, to Mr. Guerra to comment on those um, challenges from the requester's perspective for the appeal structure. So for uh, our, um, in our jurisdiction, like I said earlier, the request itself is only $5 and it's free to make a complaint to my office. Uh, most uh, requesters are not represented by lawyers because we are we are doing more like an ombudsman type of investigation. So we are asking the questions and it's up to the institutions to convince me that what they have done their, the, the, the disclosure that they've decided to do or the, in the exclusion or in, in exemptions that they've used was appropriately used. Um, we do go back to the requesters sometimes to ask if they want to, sometimes what we realize is they, they receive, let's say a thousand pages and, but really they, are, they just want to complain about 10 pages. They don't, they don't want us to do an investigation of the full package. So this is really helpful because it really scoped the investigation too. And we are then dealing with what the person really wants. Um, in terms of timelines, unfortunately, uh, as I said earlier, we have about 4,000 cases a year. I've got 60 investigators. It's never enough. Uh, but at the same time, we are dealing also with institutions that are under resources and they have to respond to our complaints as well as they have to respond to requests. It's often the same unit that do both. Um, so we are looking at a timeline about nine months, but there are some cases that are so complex. And when I arrive at my office in 2018, we already, we had a backlog of 2,700 complaints that dated all the way down to 2008, I think. Uh, so 11 years we had, those are very few, but still completely unreasonable. I've said as one of my priority when I became commissioner that uh, my priority was to get rid of the backlog and to really have uh, a, a turnaround of nine, nine months so that, and it, even nine months is too much. When you think that the information the person is asking is relevant now, it's not relevant tomorrow. It's, you know, especially for journalists, they can't wait nine months for the, the information they're requesting. The articles have to be written. Um, so I'm trying really hard. We have an early case resolution team and when and complaints are coming in, we're trying to resolve them right away because the analysts who, are, who have dealt with it at the institution's level, remember those files there. They just finished you know, dealing with it. So it's a lot easier to try to get a resolution, uh, an informal resolution uh, for early, like uh, early on. Um, and we are very successful with those uh, type of case. And uh, we resolve about 85% of our cases per year. Uh, only 15% moves to the more formal investigation, recommendation, order, uh, where we, we we have to agree sometimes to disagree with the institution and issue a report. Uh, that was the other thing that I invest, I started. Um, enough is enough. We can't just go back and forth. You know, I, like it's nice to negotiate, but at one point you have to decide enough uh, time has been spent on a case and we just have to do the analysis uh, ourselves and send a report to the minister responsible for the public body. Uh, and I can tell you it has had a lot of um, impact. And, uh, and uh, yeah, they don't like having a report being published about their, their institution when they, you know, when they can resolve it informally, they will. So this is basically, and my, my office has a budget of $15 million, uh, roughly uh, 140 employees uh, total with the corporate services, uh, legal services. Somebody asked earlier, how many legal uh, uh, do, I, we, do we have? We have a, an office of five legal counsels um only which they are very very busy uh 65 uh, investigators and uh we also have a communication team so uh, roughly 120 we're hiring right now 23 new investigators we just got a new budget of three million dollars extra which is great so i'm in the process of hiring 23 new investigators which was very exciting <laughs> thank yeah, you uh, 
thank you. I, I, I would like to underline that, that, that point that you mentioned about the importance or the, the potential value of an information commissioner, particularly an information commissioner with uh, some sort of binding powers to just get the public agency to the table and to use that, that binding authority as in a way that supports uh, mediation processes. I think that's, that's an excellent point that's not mentioned enough um, in this discussion around uh, powers. Um, uh, Mr. Guerra, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how the system works? Uh, what kind of timelines um, uh, fuels generally run on? Are there are, what, what kind of costs are associated with it? Sí. The requests and the resources, the complaints don't cost anything that is electronic, don't require a lawyer. It's very simple. The complaint can say, I am not, I don't agree. All the work that requires, we do it ourselves. In that sense, we may require independently additional information to the institution or to the request. The only thing that has a cost is the inform if the information doesn't have, we don't have it electronically, or if it was requested in another way, then we have to find a way to get the information. If I have, if we have to send that information, then it will be a cost to send it. The first three copies are free. And if the requested, requested, and, and if they say that they don't have enough funds, we can give all the information to them. The time of time is 20 business days to respond, 60 plus 20, so it will be 60, 40 plus 20 to resolve the complaint, 10 days to give that order to the resolution that gives, if you make the math, about 90 days, four months, four months and a half, if we are saying business days. Regularly, we are trying not to get to the limits we can say if someone and they go through the whole course, they will have that information in two months and a half, something like that. The problem that we have now is, is that we cannot reduce the time so much because we have a lot of charge. We, we're getting 19 complaints a month or requests a month. We are four commissioners and that takes two for us to have 350 that are in the line of access, but it's communication, electronic, the capacitation. They have 720, the, the other 350, they dedicate to personal data in the public system and part of the institutions that are in the private sector. When we talk about 550 millions, we have to say that 30, like 30 million is to the access of the information and 20 million is to the other personal data. That's what I can commend. There is no cost in that sense. It's very easy. The only problem could be the access to internet that not everybody has it in the sense that in Mexico, the access to internet has it only percent of the population based on the information from the census last year. Uh, can I maybe go back to, uh, for, uh, first of all, there, there's lots of wonderful questions coming in, into the chat. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, maybe I could go back to, to Mr. Uh, Wiener on the, uh, costs question, um, because obviously it's, it's expensive to uh, set up such an institution. It costs money to maintain such an institution. Um, do you think that the, but there's also potential, presumably going to be savings on the other side as cases are not as likely to be pushed through the courts, um, which presumably means uh, less resources of the government to fight there, a simplified procedure, uh, less resources 
uh, to, to, to support the, the, the judiciary in hearing those cases. It's, it's supposed to be cheaper to go through an administrative structure um, than to, to, to be relying on the courts. Do you think that it's, it's, it's possible or likely to, to frame the debate in, that, in those kinds of terms as an avenue to save money as well? Or is that wishful thinking? Is that, is that, is that an unrealistic way to, to frame the argument in, realistically? I mean, I think you could, I mean, I, I, I haven't done, I haven't done the research and analysis. I think you could probably make some pretty good predictions on the way towards uh, quantifying the costs and the benefits. Um, I'm a little skeptical that we would be talk that, that um, I, I'm a, a little skeptical of the suggestion that uh, an alt, a different regime uh, would save a lot of money in terms of system, save a lot of money system-wide. I mean, comparatively speaking, you know, the courts are pretty efficient. Um, uh, the courts are pretty efficient and the number of FOIA cases in the courts are not enormous. I mean, that's maybe one of the problems here is that there's not sufficient recourse to the courts by requesters. Um, but I, I mean, my own sort of sense, my, my, own, my own sort of general sense to answer your question is, is that, FOIA compliance costs money, and uh, this system costs money, and the system is probably under-resourced across the board. Uh, agencies don't have sufficient resources in many cases uh, to deal with their FOIA dockets, especially uh, more, more difficult, non-routine FOIA requests of the sort that you might get, say, from a journalist or something. So I don't think really there's anything, you know, we, we, we need to just, you know, you need to decide how much money as a, as a country we want to spend uh, on transparency and information disclosure. And I think that uh, while perhaps there could be some uh, savings associated with a uh, administrative regime, um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think that we ought to pin our hopes here on a system like that um, being the answer to the resource sort of allocation question. I think we have we have a, we have we have a you know a lot of the problems associated with FOIA are, are, are not enforcement and adjudication related. They're managerial and they're also resource questions. And um, I think I mean I think the the bottom line is probably if if we want a FOIA regime that works uh, much more efficiently than we have now, uh, Congress would have to spend some money on it. Yeah, it, there is a bit of a, a bit of a contradiction there, and that you know, presumably you you set the system up because you want people to use it, but the more people use this system, obviously it takes more resources, uh, and and so you know it it it, it can also be be a difficult sell um, from that perspective. I mean, you know, I think yeah. if you you know if, if we if, if we want to start talking about cost savings in the system, there are probably things we could do on the legal managerial front. I mean, you, you, I mean, one answer is certainly um, enhanced use of, uh, of affirmative or proactive disclosure. I mean, that's that's really where uh, a lot of the discussion has to be, uh, in my view. Uh, and then also steering, as I think Margaret Quoka has uh, has has persuasively argued, steering a lot of the so-called sort of first po person FOIA requests, where people are seeking routine informations in about themselves. Um, through other channels within agencies to facilitate the delivery of the information in a more cost-effective way. And, and I think that that also opens up a, a, an interesting broader question about the role of an oversight body as, as a champion of transparency, um, of promoting uh, not only robust implementation of the system, but potential and, and, and hearing appeals, but also uh, uh, promoting proactive disclosure uh, promoting uh, sort of as, as, as the face of uh, access to information, the face of transparency um, as, as a, a governmental champion on that issue. Um, maybe we could go back um, to, to uh, our other, uh, to, to, to both the other panelists to talk more about their sort of broad promotional role. Uh, again, um, to, to Carolyn first. Thank you. Actually, it's been quite, um... One of the key messages that I've been uh, issuing since the beginning of the pandemic, especially uh, people were complaining that uh, they couldn't work from home uh, on the access requests. And I keep telling institutions, you do not wait. You, have to, you don't have to wait for access requests to, to issue the information. 
you do re, you know what's important for Canadians, especially now in times of pandemic. What are you know with all these decisions and money being spent in Canada to uh, to deal with and manage the the situation? So we call it voluntary disclosure uh, as opposed to proactive disclosure because we our act has a specific part on uh, proactive disclosure and I don't think that they need to have uh, legislation to tell them what they need to be issuing. I'm hoping that the more requests they get on one specific topic, they're going to realize it's something that people need and want to know, so they should disclose it uh, no matter what. Um, the, but the, one of the big issues in Canada, though, that it, you wouldn't have in, in the States um, is that our, uh, we have to pro- everything that's proactively disclosed or provided by our government has to be done in both languages, official languages, French and English. And that's just some other uh, issue with respect to resources because uh, we, it's costing a lot of money to our public bodies to translate everything that they would like to proactively disclose. Um, so there, that's been a, a, a challenge that I've been uh, given a, a lot. Like we, we want to give more, but we, we have no money to translate everything. So we can't. Uh, so anyway, so that's something that uh, it's, it's on top of all the challenges is an additional one. But I do believe that uh, as uh, commissioners or as um, you say, our role is to really encourage institutions to think about uh, providing more information in a very proactively way instead of having to ask or waiting for access requests. It's the same thing with Immigration Canada. They have a portal for immigration requesters, but they don't seem to be giving them the information they need. So that's why they have 120,000 requests every year. So that's something that we're looking with them, a solution where the information is available right away, not, um, yeah. The, the access request should really be the last resort. You should be able to get the information without having to rely, you know, ask for it. Thank you. Yeah, the, the translation uh, challenges are it's such a uniquely Canadian. Uh, I, I guess not, there, there are obviously not the only bilingual country out there, but it's a, it's a very Canadian uh, issue. Um, uh, Mr. Guerra, did you, did you want to respond? To the uh, to the to the broader question about um, being an internal champion of transparency. Sí, sí. Y- yes. Well, well how the two panels have one part. So the requests don't keep growing. Is that they have to publish information that the law requires them to is an act of transparency you if when you re, when you are reactive you are giving information because it's being requested contracts is an example a lot of these contracts was being requested aloud now by law they have to publish all of their contracts so now it has lengthened the request because the whole contract in a PDF and some of the ranges that allows to identify the amount that is being used in that sense. So this is the first homework, the first work, and we have known the more they publish, Better people will rather just go to the portal, go at 30 minutes, an hour, find the information that that you are, instead of waiting 10, 20 days to give that information. And then maybe the information that they give you is not enough. Is They don't either give you all the information or it's not like they are. Sometimes what they publish allows more requests to go more into detail. One of the things that, that the pandemic showed us, not all the information is there. The law never said that you have to put a list of the hospitals, COVID hospitals. So only the hospitals. So we had to do proactively a list of those hospitals that were COVID hospitals. They are method ways to give this information that the people are requiring. If you know the information that the people are requesting, then you know the information that they need and that we are able to publish proactively. I will end up saying, they say the same thing. I have 
to, they say the offices, the government offices, they say, I have to only give the information that is being requested. I have to give all the information because you evaluate me and, and then you give me a fine if I don't do it. Sometimes these are the things and the situation we are working and we know that the pandemic get, made it very clear that being transparent proactively and giving all the information and focus the information and, and section it by group and giving that in, concrete information because sometimes it's very general the information that they give but don't give the information that the public is looking for so i'm in the middle of the two panelists we are doing a lot of exercises the problem is that it gives into the option the the law established that we have to do it and sometimes it's a problem and if they, they don't do what the law requests so the things that the law don't require them to do then they don't do it in some cases in that sense a better way is only way when they disclose the information so we uh i have a few minutes left um we had a hand up uh from uh stanley trump who, uh, was interested in asking a question uh stanley do you want to go ahead uh good day uh thank you uh, yes, I'm Stanley Trump, journalist from Vancouver, and I'd just like to uh, put uh, two links I posted in the sidebar. One is to uh, the FOI Commission of Connecticut, which uh, the National Freedom of Information Coalition uh, tells me is a longtime American gold standard for FOI re dispute resolution with a commission and order making power. And as they, half the states have an ombuds program, but they are fairly weak and have no teeth to um, American nationally certainly needs a good national model. Uh, second is the links to a, a book I wrote to have fallen behind with a, a chapter comparing all the world's laws and their uh, dispute uh, resolution mechanisms. And uh, speaking as a journalist, I have to know that now in the years to come, uh, I think a big source of disputes will be FOI requests on the COVID subject itself, uh, which I believe is nothing more important. So as to learn from records of what worked, what didn't, to help improve public health responses in the future. So that would be a large uh, source of disputes. And just, I'd like to rewind to a prior stage, like before legal FOI legal disputes reach the commission or court stage, uh, ways to avert disputes before they even arise. One is, uh, in fact, discussions on uh, law reform and regulations such as Canada, we have every five year legislative uh, parliamentary reviews of the law uh, to resolve systemic problems before they arise. I don't know if Mexico or America have such reviews. That would be the equivalent of a Senate or House Special Committee, I suppose. And the second is I was trying to restart a Canadian sort of Freedom of Information Process Forum to discuss systemic problems, a council of uh, ATI applicants and senior government officials who would uh, hash out um, systemic uh, problems, uh, procedural problems mostly, and organized by a, a neutral third party. I found a model in Washington, D.C. It's called uh, the Federal Freedom of Information Advisory Committee, which was set up by National Archives in 2014 to foster dialogue, solicit public comments, and uh, re develop recommendations. It reports to the U.S. archivist and the office, uh, the OGIS uh, chairs that committee. I wonder if anyone could tell me uh, how those systems are working um, to resolve problems before they arise and if that might work in Canada or Mexico. Perhaps Mr. Wiener knows more the American scene. Yeah, uh, uh, you've, you've name checked a few people who uh, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but there's also uh, folks in the audience, especially because we're, we're just right near uh, the end of it. But uh, Mr. Wiener, did you did you want to respond to that at all? Um, I don't I, I can't really I, I what I can't I can't speak to the sort of efficacy of the uh, OGIS um, recommendation process, the extent to which its recommendations mm -hmm. are implemented. Um, I do think I mean, there's no question that we have um, we have a system in place. Uh, through OGIS and, and also to, to some extent OIP uh, for uh, people within the system and, and people who work in the system with the system 
to um, make recommendations. OGIS makes, with some frequency, uh, relative frequency, makes recommendations to Congress. Uh, Congress has uh, acted on some of those recommendations. Uh, I don't think there's sort of a shortage of, of, of recommendations out there uh, um, um, to improve the system. I think in, in that respect, we do have a pretty good mechanism in place, an apparatus in place uh, for um, identifying problems and um, making recommendations. Um, that's of course very different than a uh, in, in enforcement structure that has, um, uh, you know, the power uh, to order agencies to do things. So we're, we're uh, just right at half past at the moment. Um, so uh, I, I, I uh, do uh, apologize for um, uh, any of the questions in the chat that we didn't get to, although I, I have to thank uh, both our panelists as well as uh, the folks in the audience who've been uh, doing uh, yeoman's work. Uh, in, in responding to a lot of these queries themselves. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be avenues um, to follow up, particularly uh, as you know, this is uh, hopefully going to be the start of uh, a broader conversation uh, on potential uh, improvements to uh, the FOIA system. Um, so I want to uh, give uh, my thanks to all of our panelists, uh, as well as uh, to my colleagues at the Media Freedom of Information and Access Clinic for collaborating to, to set this up. Um, this has been uh, some wonderful food for thought uh, in terms of our, our discussions uh, on improving FOIA. And I look forward to, to chatting further about this uh, with um, all of you, hopefully, and, and, and with uh, bringing more folks in the audience uh, into this conversation. So thanks very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody.